And welcome to everybody for the first talk in 2017. Wow. Um, they come to your door in pairs, sprouting their faith mercilessly. Many other Christians see them as a cult, but then aren't all religions cults. This evening, we have a very special guest, in former Jehovah's Witness, Paul Grundy. He'll tell us his life story and experiences, as well as the ramifications for him and for others in leaving the religion. He'll enlighten us about the workings of his former cult. Um, we will have a break after about 50 minutes, and uh, Paul will resume after that, and we'll have question time after that as well. Please welcome Paul. and I'm going to be talking about the topic of Jehovah's Witnesses and the monopolization of the salvation. So, sir? Yeah. <laughs> so the agenda tonight is we'll go over my life story, which lasts for a while, and then through the beliefs of Jehovah's Witnesses, a discussion of whether they should be considered a cult, uh, then what is wrong with uh, the religion, and then a little bit about the uh, child abuse um, scandal that's been going on with the Royal Commission over the last couple of years. And then finally I'll be discussing how to help somebody leave the religion and then finish off with some questions. First of all, I just wanted to get an idea of what people think about when they uh, uh, hear the word Jehovah's Witnesses and what people know about Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, except for the people who are Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, does anyone, what sort of comes to mind when you think of uh, Jehovah's Witness? Door knocking? <laughs> Watched out. Watched out? Cool. Yeah, yeah. No blood transfusions? No blood transfusions? No blood transfusions? Yeah. No, what's no, that? Anything else? Happiness. Happiness? Okay. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Shunning, yeah, that's good. Invasive. Invasive? Invasive. Invasive, okay, cool. All right, so you actually answered all the questions, right? There's a, they uh, wake people up on Saturdays. I guess that's invasive. They distribute the watchtower. Uh, they don't have blood transfusions and they don't celebrate birthdays. So this is what people mostly know about, about Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, but there's a lot more to know than, than just this. The other thing that people often say is they can't drink alcohol, they ride, ride around on bikes in twos and wear magic underwear, but that's... They often get confused, uh, and they do have a very similar background and actually very similar uh, uh, way of life as well. So I just wanted to show you a little clip um, from pop culture, and this is, this is what people generally think about when they see a Jehovah's Witness. What? What? The Jehovah Witnesses put this video out to tell deaf people not to masturbate. <laughs> <laughs> People think about Jehovah's Witnesses, but it's actually not what Jehovah's Witnesses are about. What Jehovah's Witnesses think that you are supposed to know about them is that they preach the good news of the kingdom. So their message is that they are the only religion that preaches the good news of the kingdom, and it's how you react to that message as to whether or not you will be surviving Armageddon. And so it's interesting that nobody here actually brought that up as being the main topic of Jehovah's Witnesses. And when we look at this, um, that is the the promise that they have, that the, uh, the good news is that you will live forever in this surreal world um, and it actually is forever, it's for infinity on this planet. So the words that uh, come to mind often when people think about the group is that they're harmless and they're outwardly benign. 
But uh, again, this is not really what we're going to uh, see as we run through the uh, presentation tonight. And I do have a, a lot of information, so it's going to be quite a ride. Also, I just have to uh, introduce a couple of terms. So the uh, Watchtower Bible and Tract Society of Pennsylvania is the legal entity that controls the religion. And it's often referred to as the society or the organisation. So whenever I refer to the, the church, the group as, it's, as itself, I call it Watchtower. Um, and then when I refer to the followers, they are Jehovah's Witnesses. Because I don't make any, uh, I, don't, I don't want to be, appear to be uh, negative about Jehovah's Witnesses as individuals. They're generally very nice people. So the, what I'm criticising here tonight will be the, the religion and the structure of the religion as opposed to the individuals. And then there's one other term that you need to know, because this is really the fundamental basis of this talk tonight, and that's disfellowshipping and shunning. So, this is an uh, a extremely um, invasive uh, practice of Jehovah's Witnesses that really affects everything that people do within the religion. The 1% of Jehovah's Witnesses get disfellowshipped every single year, and only one in three of them ever return. And once you're disfellowshipped, and it can be for something as minor as smoking, or it can be for something as uh, bad as murder, or for apostasy, um, it doesn't matter whether you're 17 or 70 when you get disfellowshipped, for the rest of your life you must not be spoken to under almost any circumstance. And it is only if you return to the religion that you're allowed to be spoken to again. So we'll see just how damaging this practice is as we go on. So here's uh, my story. I, uh, I'm the author of a website called jwfacts.com. And it's one of the most referenced websites on the internet regarding Jehovah's Witnesses, and it's uh, generally considered to be the most accurate uh, summation of the religion. Um, so I'm considered public enemy number one, or up there in the top ten anyway for Jehovah's Witnesses, which is not anything I would have dreamed about ever becoming. Uh, I never really planned to become that either, but I just sort of fell into it. And the reason the website is popular is that because it is accurate. I try not to have any of the... Um, the emotion in it that is very often the case when people leave the religion. I'm also not particularly sensationalist about it all as well. I was uh, brought up in a, a family that was very, very involved. I worked at the headquarters. Um, I'm a personal friend of one of the governing body members that runs the religion from America. And I know that there's no secret sort of society thing going on. There's no conspiracy theories. It's just another religion with people thinking that what they're doing is, uh, is right. And so uh, there's nothing to be sort of uh, sensational of this about. It's just a matter of going, the practices, are they or aren't they uh, beneficial to followers? So this is, uh, this is when it started for me. I was uh, two years old, uh, back in 1971. And my mother had just had my sister and was going through postnatal depression. And she drove me and my sister to the, uh, the wharf and she was going to drive off and, and try and commit suicide. And it was this, during this period that she was, uh, all this emotional period, that the witnesses came along and offered her some sort of support and something that she needed. She, she had been actually a refugee from Hungary, had come across and had suffered from racism, didn't have a lot of friends. And so to have a group come and knock at your door and be an instant made family and friends got her at the time when she was most vulnerable. It was also the time when uh, the Jehovah's Witness religion was the fastest growing religion in the world. So in the 60s and up to 1975, they were saying that um, the end was going to come in 1975, and they had growth rates of about 20% year on year for five years there. So there's a huge amount of uh, energy within the religion and a huge amount of growth then. My father, he uh, just went along for the ride. He just uh, knew that if he wanted to be happy, he had to keep mum happy. So. He'd gone from being a Catholic to an atheist, back to a Catholic, and then to a Jehovah's Witness. And when he died, he admitted he didn't particularly believe it anyway. So it was just faith, and he thought it was best for the family, which I told him I was pretty upset about. So they were baptised in 1973. And I have to uh, make the point, though, that Mum and Dad weren't stupid people. They were both university educated, and Dad particularly was in incredibly intelligent. And so the point is that you don't need to be uh, smart, or you don't need to be uh, dumb, you don't need to be educated or not to be uh, sucked into a cult. It's, uh, it works on a totally different level than on an intelligence level. It's more of an, an emotional level. Now when I went to school, um, I was well entrenched by the age of five or whatever in the Jehovah's Witness ways. And so I was uh, like totally believed by that age, um, as you do when you trust everything your parents say. And one of the things is that my parents 
expected me to be have all A's in my conduct. They they felt that because I was representing Jehovah, it was most important that I was always good at school. And for the, my entire uh, school life, I always got A's in every single uh, aspect of conduct. And also, I was expected to do well scholastically as well. So I was to be an example because I was representing the uh, the most high God of the universe, Jehovah. But I always felt different because I was a Jehovah's Witness, and so I never felt like I was part of uh, part of people at school because everybody else in uh, at school were worshiping Satan, and so they were all going to die at Armageddon, whereas I was on the side of Jehovah. And uh, one of my one of the girls I knew in the congregation, she used to actually tell her friends in primary school that they were all going to die at Armageddon. And the, uh, the teacher had to tell, had to get the parents in and say it was just not appropriate to say that. But that is what, as a young Jehovah's Witness, is what you believed. Luckily, my, um, my teachers were in every single year were always very, very good. They, uh, they always uh, really looked after me. I think they understood sort of what was, you know, how difficult it was being a witness child. And so, for example, when the Easter Bunny used to come with the Easter eggs, uh, they would come down, come down and have a little basket with the uh, just normal chocolates in there so that I wouldn't be offended and could participate. And when it was uh, birthday time, then the teacher would have a little special cake for me that was a non-birthday cake. But still, I, uh, I always um, sort of knew that I was sort of you know, crossing the line there. So although the teachers were actually trying to be uh, do nice, I still had a bit of guilt about it. Because <clears throat> as we'll learn, guilt is a, is a fundamental part of running a religion. Uh, when I was eight or turning eight, I was in a shared class with my sister. So she, uh, she was in grade one and I was in grade two. And so she told uh, one of her friends that it was my birthday. So the friend told the teacher, the teacher pulled me up onto the stage and they all sang happy birthday. And I was horrified because obviously that's, uh, that's evil. So then uh, as, sisters do, <laughs> as sisters do, I, uh, I went, uh, we went home and she ran and told mum even though she had set me up for this. And so, Mum read to me from Revelation 3.16. It says, So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. So my little eight-year-old self was making God vomit. And this is, a, this is from the, the Bible stories book for children back from the 60s. So this was uh, from Paradise Lost to Paradise Gain. And so this is, this is the type of information I was read to as a child. It says, where can people hide from this destruction coming from God? Nowhere. God says, not one of them shall escape. And I used to have nightmares constantly of this picture here. The, of, uh, I actually thought that's what happens in earthquakes, but apparently they, they don't really do that. But that I, would, um, <laughs> that I was going to fall down this ravine. And so I was always having nightmares of falling. And uh, I still can't bungee jump or do anything like that. <laughs> and I, I mean, I know a lot of, lot of children, uh, falling is a common uh, nightmare. But I don't think this sort of information... Um, helped and certainly not appropriate for children. Now, I, I actually never thought I was going to die, as uh, all Jehovah's Witnesses uh, believe, and I didn't actually even think I was ever going to finish school. And I remember in grade six, I was so terrified of going to high school that I was praying that the Armageddon could come before the end of year six. <laughs> and the reason is, if you um, this uh, this article here, it says that if you are a young person, you also need to face the fact that you will never grow old in this present system of things. This system is due to end in a few years. Therefore, as a young person, you will never fulfill any career that this system has to offer. So that was in 1969, the year that I was born, and that was what I was constantly told. And yet, it's just, it just uh, bamboozles me that people know that this is what the religion has said, and 40 years later, 50 years later, whatever I am, I'm, like people are retiring and they're still telling that to the next bunch of children, like you are, you're not gonna finish school like Armageddon is so close. <laughs> so puberty came and one thing Jehovah's Witnesses don't do is masturbate. I didn't find an illustration for that, but um, the reason <laughs> is that it, uh, it leads to homosexuality. <laughs> This is uh, from the, I think this is, oh, we've seen the young people ask, but also in the Watchtower. It says that masturbation is no mere part, innocent pastime, but rather a practice that can lead to homosexual acts. So I should say they shouldn't do it, but uh, they do do it because I think most people do it. And because of that, Joe's Witness uh, teenagers suffer from an incredible amount of guilt 
I actually thought I was going to die at Armageddon because I was a wanker. And, uh, so I had to go and confess to the elders, and you can imagine the absolute humiliation of this elder coming every week and asking me <laughs> what I'd done that week, and it was, uh, yeah, it was just, I just feel that. Uh, <laughs> It's very embarrassing. <laughs> so um, somehow I managed to abstain long enough though to get baptised. And uh, that's not me, but um, that is a very typical baptism uh, image there where they bat they're baptising normally between the age of 10 and 18. So it's, uh, it's, it's interesting because Catholics condemn... Uh, oh, sorry, Jehovah's Witnesses condemn the Catholics because they do infant baptism, but then they force uh, like young teenagers to get baptised. And what they're doing is, um, is something that's like, is far more, um, has a far more greater impact on the rest of their lives by getting uh, baptised as a Jehovah's Witness. So when I got this fellowship later on in life, my mother said to me that I deserved to be shunned because I knew what I was getting into. I had done a lot of uh, research before I got baptised. So at the age of 16, apparently, I had enough uh, world, world knowledge to know exactly what I was getting into and exactly what the punishment would be if I got kicked out of there. And yet at uh, 16, uh, you can't smoke legally, you can't drink, you can't drive, you're not allowed to vote, you can't join the military, you can't get married, and yet they think that it's uh, appropriate that a child can make a far more um, life-affecting decision of uh, baptism. Now, Armageddon hadn't arrived by the time I finished uh, school, and my parents quite unusually uh, suggested that I go to university. Um, it's, it's something that Jehovah's Witnesses are not supposed to do. Uh, but I went to the University of Tasmania, which is one of the better universities in Australia, uh, particularly the view there. And it's, uh, I felt guilty, though, again, that I shouldn't be going to university. Um, and so I was also regular pioneering at the same time. So I was holding a job, going to get going to university, and also preaching for 20 hours every single week. And that was to sort of stop me being influenced by the worldly people at the university. Uh, overall, I was a, the poster child for the ideal family uh, as a Jehovah's Witness. My father was an elder, uh, the presiding overseer, and my mother a regular pioneer. So she, for many years she was doing, um, basically devoting herself to door knocking uh, most days of the week. And uh, both my sister and I ended up in full-time service, and we both ended up actually serving at the headquarters in Australia. We all gave uh, regular uh, speaking engagements and uh, were interviewed as a family at the convention. And yet, I never really believed. I always knew that there was something wrong. And that's the really sad thing about indoctrination, is that you, you have the intuition that something's wrong, but you don't have the intellectual and emotional capacity to understand why it's wrong and, and what is wrong. And um, particularly because the religion indoctrinates you, they use um, thought-stopping techniques. So every time you have something that, that comes up that doesn't seem right, there's an answer, there's a thought-stopping technique to stop you actually investigating further into that thought. They, uh, you love to use the scripture, trust in Jehovah with all your heart and do not lean upon your own understanding. Uh, the thing is that, that you're not trusting in Jehovah. Jehovah isn't personally telling you this is the truth. It is trust in the interpretation of the leaders in the American religion and what they write in the Watchtower and, and trust in that. Don't lean upon your own understanding. Also, if you have any doubts, you have to quell them because those doubts are from Satan. Satan is influencing you. And this is something I just could not get over. And this is why I lasted so long because every time I, th I thought that, no, this is definitely wrong, I knew that it was Satan that was influencing my mind. I couldn't trust that I wasn't having doubts because I wasn't just wanting to be evil, but that I actually, um, that it was actually something legitimate. But I always had an issue with prayer. So this is a, an actual um, picture of a, Jehovah's, a bus that was carrying Jehovah's Witnesses. 10 people died on that bus and 45 people were injured. So it, I realized it doesn't matter how much you pray, God just doesn't answer them. Like things occasionally will happen, which are, uh, Maybe be coincidence, who knows, and then, but generally things just don't get answered. And so I, I had this issue, and there's always, the, they say that, well, you, um, Jehovah has to pick the, the, pr the prayers to answer, and he has to test you, and, and all these different answers. But basically, I sort of just knew inside that Jehovah wasn't answering my prayers, particularly my prayers for faith. There's also no compelling answer to why an all-powerful, loving God allows wickedness. And the Watchtower doctrine on this is, is uh, particularly weak. And then the other thing I just could not get my head around is why God would kill eight 
billion, I think it was back then, probably five billion people, and only say five million people, which was the number of Jehovah's Witnesses. I was, um, I was lucky to be in this religion. I didn't deserve any anything better than anyone else. I wasn't different than anyone else. So it was just purely luck that I had gotten into this religion, and it just seemed completely unfair that Jehovah would uh, kill all these people, billions of people, simply because they didn't know who he was, and they'd, yet they'd never even had a chance to find out who he was in most cases. So when I, when I graduated, I applied to work at Bethel. So this is the Australian headquarters of Jehovah's Witnesses, and it's, if you want to know what it's like to be in a cult, now this is a great example, because it's a, a commune out in the bush there where you're with a, a whole lot of people, uh, happy, smiling people, um, but nobody likes being there. So when I, I, when, I came, when I came to leave, I really wanted to leave at, at a certain point, and the uh, brother Moritz, the, uh, the, the overseer, called me in and he said that I need to stay there. He goes, nobody wants to be here. You, God didn't create us to live in a commune like this. God created us to live in the pictures of the new system. The people are here because they know that very soon Armageddon's going to come. So just keep sticking it out. And I stuck it out, unfortunately, for another year because that became an extremely traumatic year for me the next year. But also I think that was the turning point uh, that sort of brought me to where I am now. So it was my time at Bethel that convinced me that the Watchtower Society doesn't have God's direction. It was in uh, 1994 that I had my first aha moment. I had a, a friend of mine in Bethel and he, um, he was made an elder. So he was actually moved to a new congregation they appointed him as an elder. And the doctrine is that if you are appointed as an elder, it's actually God's Holy Spirit has personally chosen you. So the uh, other elders pray about you, they send the application to Bethel, it gets prayed over, and God has chosen that person to be one of the elders or priests of that, that congregation. Anyway, this, uh, this friend of mine had actually been having, um, committing adultery for seven years, and he had actually been bringing his wife's best friend into Bethel and having sex with her in, in the headquarters of, uh, of Australia there. And so this is where I knew that God's Holy Spirit is not directing um, the religion, or not at least directing the, uh, the appointments, which then obviously means that most likely it's not directing the, um, the doctrine as well. The, um, the problem with that is that I didn't actually um, really understand then about the doctrine. So one of the other thought-stopping techniques is where else will I go? So I convinced myself, well, all right, maybe they don't have Holy Spirit, but this still is the best religion out there. And so that kept me there for another 10 years. So from the moment when I knew I, I probably should have known that this was not uh, God's truth, uh, it took another 10 years to, to get out of there. And that was because of a lack of knowledge. I just didn't know uh, what I needed to, to, to help leave. But more so, it was because of fear. And this is a... Uh, one of the motivators for Jehovah's Witnesses. I, was a, a, I had fear of apostate information. If I read anything from anyone else, that that was going to be wrong. I had fear of Satan's influence. I was fearful of losing my family and my friends. I was fearful of the, the worldly people like you guys here, of, uh, of how, how I'd be treated. And so then I was also fearful that I was gonna be lonely. And also I was afraid that I was actually wrong and I couldn't trust myself. And most of all, I was in fear that I would die at Armageddon, that I was wrong, and then I would get destroyed at Armageddon. By 2004, though, the 10 years later, I was ready to leave. And I think subconsciously, that was when I had prepared myself enough for what was going to come. And also, there was a, a movie, uh, The Age of Innocence, and I didn't want to be like Newland Archer, who I thought was pathetic, because he, and I thought I was being exactly like him. I don't know if you've seen that movie, but he married a woman that he wasn't really in love with instead of the woman he loved because of cultural expectation. And so after his wife dies, he still was too fearful of what, the, uh, what his family and culture thought to even go and visit the woman that he loved. And I thought, oh, I'm going to get to my deathbed knowing that Armageddon is not going to come because I know this isn't the truth. And I'm going to sit there going, I just wasted my entire life living up to the expectations of other people. And so I uh, started the, uh, the process out of there. It was um, also triggered very much by my next aha moment, and that was a shepherding call where the, the elders came around and they, they wanted to 
reinvigorate me. I'd become fairly inactive. I wasn't uh, answering at the meetings and they wanted to know what the problem was. I, I told them that I was uh, having issues with faith. And so they said, well, you need to do more study. So that's always the answer. Every single time we pray, it's called the past, prayer, association, service and study. So pray more and study more and then your faith will come back. And I was like, I have never actually done any proper research. All I've ever studied was what the Watchtower had written. And so um, I realized I've got to check everything the Watchtower has written, like study what other people believe, what other religions believe. And it was through that process there that I started to um, really waken up from the fact that this really was the truth. And I found that other religions have equally strong uh, doctrines. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, there's also a person here in the audience that, uh, that <laughs> just here, uh, Adele, so she also was quite instrumental in, in uh, me leaving as well. So what oh. happened, I was uh, being recruited uh, by Adele and uh, she, um, I'm not sure if this is the right way to, to do recruitment because she hadn't actually read my resume by the looks of things because <laughs> later on, <laughs> read the first page, not the last page, because on the, uh, the way home, she, and so that was an interesting conversation. But shortly after that, in December 2004, there was an earthquake and it caused a tsunami and it killed throughout Indonesia and, and Asia there 250,000 people. And so I had, was suddenly like, oh my God, like, uh, this is the last days, um, Armageddon is coming. And I, I was like doubting whether I really should be getting back into the religion. And, the, um, and that's because this is what the Watchtower writes. It says the frequency of major earthquakes has increased to about 20 times that of what it was on average during the 2000 years before 1914. So the Watchtower teaches that Jesus' rulership started in 1914 and to, to support that they say that they are, one of the signs of the last days is this 20 times increase in the number of earthquakes. So that was one of the pillars of my faith, actually, because I really like statistics, and that just seemed to be something that you, you couldn't change. This is like a proof that God has put there to, to prove this is the last days. And then I get a message from Adele, and she just wrote, I can't exactly, exactly remember what, but something like this. It said, don't worry, more people in the region died from an earthquake in 1737, and that was all. And that absolutely blew my mind. <laughs> I, I, it was really, this was the, like a, a life-shattering moment because I went off, madly started uh, researching earthquakes and there hasn't been any more earthquakes since not 2000, 1914 than in millions of years before that because they, they happened gradually and consistently. And even more, there hasn't even been more deaths in the 1900s than other years. There's more people died in the 1200s and more people died in the 1700s and more people died in the 1800s than the 1900s. Despite the increase in the population, because our response to earthquakes is so much more scientific now. And so I was so incredibly angry. These bastards had been lying to me for my whole life. I had put all of my, my life into, into this, these facts that the Watchtower had given me and I knew that they, they knew that this wasn't the truth. They knew there wasn't a 20 times increase in earthquakes. And I had been controlled my whole life from these lies. And they were not only blatantly manipulating me, but they were manipulating everyone that I was close to and which was then going to affect the rest of my life as well and theirs. So going through that, that period of research, it was, it was extremely consuming, but it was also incredibly liberating and on the other hand, incredibly depressing. It was amazing to, uh, to be able to have, like, life just made sense. All these things that just didn't add up, suddenly add up, uh, added up. Um, but also, I knew I was on the precipice of absolutely losing everything. And I actually became so consumed with research that I ended up uh, losing my job because I just spent a year just researching. Because the only way I could prove Satan wasn't trying to control my brain is by writing everything down and organising it in a structured manner. And that led to me writing um, a book called The Monopolization of Truth and Salvation, Facts About Jehovah's Witnesses. And I knew that no one was ever going to read it because Jehovah's Witnesses are not allowed to read information from uh, ex-Jehovah's Witnesses, apostates, and then no one else really cares. So <laughs> I, I didn't print it. I, mean, I did print a, a couple, just self-printed, and gave them to a couple of ex-Jehovah's Witness friends. And one of, one of my relatives never joined um, the religion, and I got her to read it as well. And 
Uh, so then I thought, well, they wanted my parents to know that I had solid reasons for leaving. It wasn't just because I was evil, it was that I had actually made a, a, a proper choice. And so I put it onto the internet. There's a website called Facts About Jehovah's Witnesses. And um, as you can tell, that's a 10 year old website. Uh, and I didn't really expect that many people were ever going to read that, that either. And yet now, 10 years later, this, uh, this website has had over 3 million different people read it. So it's from something that I didn't even, I'd never planned to, never would have expected to do. It's now become quite a, uh, quite a major part of my life. So I got uh, caught for having the website. I had it up there anonymously, but uh, and I'd stopped going to meetings. I hadn't been to meetings for six months. But when the elders found out that that, that I had that website, they actually went to a lot of trouble to, to track down who um, whose website it was. They they came after me and they disfellowshipped me. So they had a judicial committee meeting, and then they announced that Paul Grundy is no longer one of Jehovah's Witnesses. So that was an incredibly liberating um, feeling. I, I finally felt free for the first time in my life. But it was also very, very hurtful. I um, really, really destroyed my life. Overnight, I had had all of my um, all of my family cut off from me because when you get this fellowship, your family are not allowed to talk to you. I had all my friends cut off from me because witnesses aren't allowed to have uh, worldly friends, so I had no friends. Um, fortunately, my wife and I have two stepchildren left at the same time, so I had at least one person that I could talk to. And I knew a few people at work, so they were actually incredibly supportive considering yeah, that they weren't really my friends at that time. So I, it was interesting because I sort of also oscillated between being very depressed and, and very ecstatic. It was almost like bipolar just for that period. And that's because of, uh, when you leave, it's quite common to go through post-traumatic stress. But uh, I now felt like I was connected with the world rather than an observer. And I was free from the perpetual negativity of Jehovah's, of the Watchtower drop doctrine. So, I know, I know there are some witnesses seem to be happy apparently, but there is a lot of depression amongst Jehovah's Witnesses because you, you cannot live in this world and not think that this is an evil world and still think that Armageddon is going to come. So the constant reinforcement is that worldly people are evil, these are the worst days, these are the last days, and so that, that negativity is ongoing so that you feel like Armageddon has to come, you have to keep serving Jehovah so that you can get into the new system. And um, I also just couldn't stop replaying what I would say to my parents if they ever talked to me again to convince them that it wasn't, um, wasn't the truth. And so what I needed to do, I went to see a psychiatrist, uh, or psychologist, um, but, but actually a cognitive behavioural therapist, and that was uh, amazing. And I'd recommend it to anyone because it teaches you how to be positive, and, I, and since then I've, I've never had uh, any any problems with depression. And it's it's like an eight, eight the course of eight hour sessions, and Medicare pays for it because it's scientifically proven. So it's not going to a psychologist and telling them how miserable your life has been and how bad things have been. It's talking about when you feel negative about something, how to re rethink positive thoughts. And uh, and so that's something that I think a lot of uh, people that leave are going through trauma um, should do. What were, one of the hardest things for me, though, was to accept that my Jehovah's Witness family, or all Jehovah's Witness parents uh, and siblings, worshipped the Watchtower well and truly above their own family. That, uh, that the organisation was actually more important to them than I was. And um, they are convinced that they're doing this for your benefit. They're convinced that if they shun their own children, then those children will come back to the religion. Unfortunately, I have friends that have been shunned for 35 years now, and they're never going back and uh, the shunning still continues because it doesn't only end until you die. But I did have um, a, uh, a wonderful child. I, well, as a witness, I never, never wanted to, uh, to have children because I just didn't want to bring them into what I was being subjected to. And then shortly afterwards, little Zach came along and he's uh, my really good little friend. And so uh, having him has been you know, really made up for everything that I lost, but also it makes me unable to comprehend even more strongly how could any religion be so powerful that it makes it their parents uh, shun their own children. So that's, uh, that's my story. So I wanted to now run through with you a little bit about um, the belief structure of Jehovah's Witnesses. So the, uh, the Watchtower Society is a Bible-based religion and it's very similar to other Christian religions, except it does have a fairly uh, strong focus on the Old Testament, more so than other Christian religions. They believe that Jehovah is the Father, 
He's uh, the almighty God that has existed eternally. God, Jehovah then created Jesus. And so Jesus is the Son of God and hasn't existed eternally. And so what that means then is that they don't believe the Trinity. They don't believe that the Father, Son and Holy Spirit are all, uh, are all, the one, all one. And so that, um, that means that people start to criticise Jehovah's Witnesses as not being Christian because they don't accept the, the Trinity. Now that's a preposterous claim because being a Christian means following Christ and following his, his, um, his teachings. And so Jehovah's Witnesses follow Jesus very closely, so they are Christian. They just have a different interpretation of what Jesus' teachings were. They uh, believe um, in creation and... I'm not sure what you call them. They're, they're not creationists. They're in a, a weird sort of, uh, sort of zone of their own because they believe that the universe was created uh, millions of years ago, but that Adam and Eve were created 6,042 years ago. Or actually, Adam was created 6,042 years ago. And the basis of 1975 was that Adam and Eve were both created 6,042 years ago. But now they say, well, we don't know when Eve was created because it was sometime after Adam. And so they still hold on to this thing that... Uh, this 6,000 years is when the, uh, the end of the 6,000 years of the creation of Eve is when the end is going to come. Now, as standard in any sort of a Christian religion normally, um, or most of them, Satan was a, an angel, uh, a good angel that became bad. He came down, he deceived Eve. She then uh, convinced Adam to follow her in her sin. And because that they had sinned by eating this fruit, uh, everybody died. And uh, so death is, is something that we've inherited because of this, uh, this act back uh, 6,000 and so years ago. So Jesus had to come down to the earth and die so that we can all be forgiven. So for some reason, um, there, it's a, there's a ransom that by having uh, offsetting one death from another was going to be what we needed so that God could uh, get things back on track. Now if you look at this picture, there's something unusual about that, and that is... Uh, Jesus is on a stake and not on a cross. And so Jehovah, Judge Rutherford, when he uh, really turned the, uh, the Watchtower religion into a, a very high control, exclusive religion, basically tried to get rid of anything that other, other people did. And so he brought in the idea that Jesus died on a stake, not a cross, and then all the other things about um, different celebrations they can't have to give them a, an air of exclusivity. The, um, the teaching is that Jesus started ruling in heaven in 1914, and there's a huge amount of evidence for this. <laughs> <laughs> this person here is a uh, governing body member, Let, and so, so he's one of the seven people that, that are running the religion at the moment. And this is uh, him at a recent um, talk. God's kingdom has been ruling in the heavens, and we've discussed during this convention for a hundred years. And it has produced tremendous effects, tremendous results. In fact, there is more evidence confirming the existence of the kingdom than the evidence that would convince us that there is gravity, electricity, wind. <laughs> So, I am, I am surprised that um, the people like my mother who went to university can actually sit through stuff like that. Um, so then, um, Jesus' earthly rule was supposed to actually come in 1914, so the witnesses predicted that the end of the world was going to happen, actually they weren't called witnesses then, so the Watchtower predicted that the end of the world was going to come in 1914. Uh, but it didn't, obviously. So they said it was going to come in 1925, but it didn't. So then they implied it was going to come in 1975, but it didn't. So then they said it was going to come within the 20th century, and now they're just um, hedging their bets by saying that it's going to come soon. And so it's incredible that people could belong to a religion that has so many failed prophecies. Like, faith, there's, there's uh, fact, faith and delusion. So facts are things that you know, like gravity. <coughs> Um, faith is something that you can't prove right or wrong. So people have faith that there's a God, they have faith that there's an afterlife. So you don't have to be ignorant to, to have faith because it's something you can't prove one way or the other. I mean, as a bunch of atheists, I'm probably throwing it out there. But it's, uh, it's something that you, you're not delusional by believing in that because it's, it's very hard to, to prove whether it does or doesn't actually um, exist. But then there's delusion where you believe things that you absolutely prove are wrong, that uh, anyone can prove without any shadow uh, or any um, 
it was just written in black and white that that was what was going to happen that year and it just didn't happen. And so Carl Sagan has written a, a brilliant summary about this uh, in Brocker's Brain. He said, one prominent American religion confidently predicted that the world would end in 1914. Well, 1914 has come and gone, and while the events of that year were certainly of some importance, the world does not, at least as far as I can see, seem to have ended. There are at least three responses that an organised religion can make in the face of such a failed and fundamental prophecy. They could have said, oh, well, did we say 1914? So sorry. We meant 2014. <laughs> a slight error in calculation. Hope you weren't convenienced in any way. And actually, the witnesses have done that with uh, in 1975 and, and how they worked out the age of creation. He, uh, but they did not say that. They could have said, well, the world would have ended, except we prayed very hard and interceded with God, and so he spared the earth. But they did not. Instead, they did something far more ingenious. They announced that the world had, in fact, ended in 1914, and if the rest of us hadn't noticed, then that was our outlook. <laughs> it, it is, and that's actually legitimately true. They did say that uh, Babylon has fallen, and that it's uh, like religions has lost its power, and that, and so, and that Satan had come down. So they, that is exactly uh, how they, they uh, sort of sidestepped the issue. And so he says, it is astonishing in the fact of such transparent evasions that this religion has any adherence at all. But religions are tough. Either they make no contentions which are subject to disproof, or they quickly redesign doctrine after disproof. The fact that religions can be so shamelessly dishonest, so contemptuous of the intelligence of their adherents, and still flourish does not speak very well for the tough-mindedness of the believers. But it does indicate, if a demonstration were needed, that near the core of the religious experience is something that is remarkably resistant to rational inquiry. And I can certainly vouch for that after having uh, many discussions with Jehovah's Witnesses. So the next uh, teaching is uh, that shortly what's going to come is the Great Tribulation. And so at the Great Tribulation, uh, worldly people are going to turn upon Jehovah's Witnesses and uh, it's going to be as if they have touched Jehovah's eye. So then he's going to come to their rescue. And that is going to be through the War of Armageddon. And so this is the War of Armageddon where Jesus uh, rides down on his horse with, uh, with uh, the, the heavenly armies and destroys uh, 8 billion people. Uh, and there's some horrific uh, uh, talks that I have recordings of of, of just how, um, how, how murderous that's going to be with the, uh, the, the birds of the heavens are going to have to come and eat up all the dead bodies, etc. Um, now, only Jehovah's Witnesses are going to survive that. And then, after that, the earth is going to be transformed into this beautiful paradise. And it's an amazing picture, this, because I always thought that that was, uh, that that was going to uh, be where I was going to live, and yet it's absolutely devoid of any sense of reality. If you, if you look at this, they, they say that there's going to be 100, they say that everyone that uh, has ever died will get resurrected, except for the poor people that just got uh, killed at Armageddon, they don't get a second chance, but everyone else will be resurrected onto the earth. So there's going to be 100 billion people on the earth over a period of a thousand years, and yet every single picture of paradise you have maybe, there's no house here, but normally one house, and there's no infrastructure, there's no road, there's no electricity, mm -hmm. and so everyone has this like vast spaces of land all over the world. It's just like a logistical impossibility. <laughs> <laughs> you have these uh, like a little child here playing with the uh, uh, the wolf and the serpent, and it's uh, so Jehovah's Witnesses believe that these uh, these animals that obviously were either designed or evolved to be perfect carnivores uh, were vegetarians until the flood, and will become vegetarians again after Armageddon. So yeah, it is, it's just amazing that, uh, that it's just so, so blatantly and obviously uh, incorrect and yet something that every single witness aspires to be for the future. Now, um, we are souls. It's about the only uh, swear, about swearing you could do as a Jehovah's Witness. Um, and so because we are souls, we, um, when we die, a soul is not immortal, so when we die, we don't have a soul that goes back to God. So our, um, we are just no more, so there is no more soul. So, um, because the soul is not immortal, it means that at death there is just nothing. Um, and this is actually, now I realise it's a quite a horrible thought, because it's, uh, it's actually based on the Adventist thought of soul sleep. 
And because you don't have a soul, what is going to happen sometime in the future when you get resurrected? God is just going to get some matter and he's going to put his memory of your memory back into your body. So he's going to, it's basically like taking a photocopy. So basically everyone that's going to get resurrected is just going to be an army of clones of, of who they actually were before. And that's why the, the traditional teaching of a soul is a lot more compelling because you are who you are and that exists forever. Now, the, uh, the, I mentioned about the, the sovereignty issue. This is how Jehovah's Witnesses describe why there is wickedness. And basically, uh, Jehovah had a bet with Satan. And so because of that now, you have billions of people that have to suffer and die for the last 6,000 years. And it's an it's a absolutely ridiculous concept because Satan went up to Jehovah and said that um, humans shouldn't worship Jehovah and they wouldn't if he didn't look after them. And so Jehovah said, all right, well, I'll give you a chance. I'll let you... Uh, I let the world go to ruin for the next few thousand years to prove that you're wrong. I mean, this is just insane because Jehovah, who had existed forever and everything was created by Jehovah, listened to one some stupid little angel that had uh, gotten uh, uh, come up with this idea and thought that he had to uh, listen to this this uh, this angel and become Satan and let people go through suffering for so long. And so, it really doesn't answer this whole idea very well of why there is wickedness. Now, this is another mistake that uh, lots of people think, is a lot of people think that only, that Jehovah's Witnesses say that only 144,000 will be saved. Now, that's not correct. It's only 144,000 that will go to heaven. And so these are the ones that will be rulers over the earth. So you see them up here with Jesus helping, uh, helping him rule over the earth. The rest of the people are the ones uh, that the rest of Jehovah's Witnesses will actually live upon the earth. So there's an unlimited number of potential Jehovah's Witnesses. As I mentioned, this is what they like to be known for, the only religion that is preaching. And uh, they used to do this predominantly from door to door, but lately they've um, decided to stand by, by shopping cart, these are carts instead, and watch people walk past, because they're not actually allowed to approach people. So I'm not sure how effective that... Actually I, actually, I do know how effective that is, because the statistics over the last few years, it went from having, uh, for an additional uh, baptism, it went from 3,000 to 4,000 to 5,000, now it's 9,000 hours of preaching for one baptism. So it shows how it's becoming incredibly ineffective. And if you had a company where you made one sale for every 9,000 hours of uh, sales work, you'd be broke. The, um, this is, uh, this is what the, the Kingdom Halls look like. Uh, so this is the latest plan for Kingdom Halls. So what the, uh, one of the things we're going to discuss later is that they're suffering financially. And so now, because they can't sell magazines to make money, they're flipping real estate. And so you look at the, this new design, and it's very much designed to be like a driveway uh, uh, or a, a shopping, a supermarket or something. It's something, it's a design now that they can easily sell and because they're getting it all donated, they're getting all free labour from the followers, and then they can flip it and buy, buy a new one. I get them to do it all again. The, um, they, they're separate from the world, so that means Jehovah's Witnesses aren't allowed to vote. They can't salute the flag and they don't go to war. So it was actually quite uh, exciting for me when I was about 36 and I went to my first election and had to get them to show me what I was supposed to be doing. They also have a restrictive law code, so you're not allowed to take illegal drugs, you're not allowed to gamble. Homosexuality and transgenderism is, uh, is definitely out. The, um, they also have to be separate from the world, and so that means that they label anything that, uh, the, that normal people do as being pagan, which again is another insane concept because everything is pagan, because everything has come from previous people, and it's because they can classify as everyone else as basically pagan. They can always find a link. And yet there's a, it's completely contradictory because you can still wear a, a, a wedding ring, which is pagan. You can still use the days of the week, which are pagan-based. But you can't have uh, birthdays, Christmas, Halloween, Mother's Day, Father's Day, or New Year's Day. So when you think of Christmas and uh, birthdays and Halloween, how does it normally make you feel? Is it good or is it bad? Happy? Good. Yeah, because I actually love it. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're, uh, they're just such fantastic uh, holidays where there's just a lot of food and a lot of family and friends coming together and, and I was always told as a child that uh, Christmas is the most uh, miserable time of the year because people realise how they don't have friends and how the family don't get on and everything but in reality like it is very enjoyable and that's, uh, that's my family there celebrating Zach's uh, sixth birthday and in Halloween we really go over, overboard for that as well. So, thinking of these doctrine, 
you're, uh, there's nothing particularly wrong with uh, most of the things that we mentioned. So you might think of Jehovah's Witnesses knowing all of that, that they're maybe they're a bit strict, uh, might be a little bit quirky or unusual, uh, but overall it's quite pleasant. And um, which brings me to the next topic, which is then, are Jehovah's Witnesses a cult? So the, I'm sure you've probably discussed this a lot before about uh, what a cult is, so I won't go over it in too much detail. And I personally enjoy describing Jehovah's Witnesses to their face as a cult, and I want to antagonise them, but it actually is a little benefit to say that, because the, uh, the word cult is completely meaningless uh, now. A cult is just basically a religion, but if you tell someone they're in a cult, they don't know whether you mean, are oh, we just in a normal religion, or whether they're in some weird religion, or whether they're in some crazy uh, suicide cult. And so people generally think that you're referring to the suicide cult, and they were like, well, of course I'm not in one of those. So uh, using the term cult isn't very successful when talking to someone. And here you, here you have two cults, the Catholic Church and uh, whoever they are. They are, <laughs> they, you know, by definition, both of those are cults. So uh, terms that are not so useful are to use the word cult, mind control and brainwashing. So one of the greatest fears that humans have is uh, losing their mind. So Alzheimer's disease is certainly um, one of the things that people fear more than most other diseases. And so to tell people that they're not in control of their mind um, is, is not going to be very effective because most people like pride themselves on, I know what I'm doing, I have control, no one's telling me what to do, no one's manipulating me. Uh, which isn't true at all because we are constantly being manipulated uh, through marketing, etc. But um, the, the term brainwashing as well, Jehovah's Witnesses love to say that they're brainwashed, they go, God has washed our brains clear, clean of all of Satan's influence. So that, that doesn't really lead to a productive conversation. <laughs> So the next uh, term then is high control. So this has been a common term for quite a while is that, well, let's determine whether religion is a high control religion as opposed to a normal religion. And um, that's now been replaced with uh, the, the, the academically accepted term now of coercive persuasion. So what we're going to look at is do Jehovah's Witnesses use coercive persuasion? And basically that means they're, are they manipulating their members? Now, there's a, this professor, uh, Zimbardo, makes a, an interesting comment here. The cult methods of recruiting, indoctrinating and influencing their members are not exotic forms of mind control, but only more intensely applied, mundane tactics of social influence. Cult leaders offer simple solutions to the increasing, increasingly complex world problems we face all day. Or face daily. They offer the simple path to happiness, to success, to salvation by following their simple rules, simple group regimentation, and simple total lifestyle. So cults, uh, you don't have to think that, that there's anything really, really uh, um, you know, out, outlandish going on. It, it really is just having a simple message. And so most of the recruiting that, that uh, cults do, including whether it be Hare Krishnas or Mormons or Sheriff's Witnesses, just by offering a nice simple message that you can live forever, you can have a family, you've got a social circle, and so when people are in an emotionally vulnerable state, um, this then is uh, something that is able to really appeal to people. Now one of the, uh, the most well-known research uh, into cults uh, was done by uh, Robert Lifton. He was uh, researching how some uh, American pilots got shot down in China. Uh, when they got rescued, they had turned to communists. They, had, they began to ex, uh, believe that communism was better than capitalism, even though they'd been pilots that had been totally indoctrinated through the American military. And, um, and they were able to be reconverted quite, uh, quite simply again. And so what, uh, what Robert Lifton found is that there's a, these eight points that are quite um, universal across uh, people that are using uh, coercive persuasion. And so this can be a political cult, it can be by a, you know, a husband who is manipulating his wife, or it can be through religions. And so there's, uh, there's environment control, which is where you limit the uh, communication you have with the outside world, uh, and that includes also shunning former members. There's mystical manip manipulation about how we have some special meaning, some prophetic word. There's the demand for perfection, because you're always going to be falling short of that then. There's a cult of confession where you have to uh, dob yourself into the elders or you uh, have to dob your other members in. There is uh, the sacred science that the leaders 
cannot be questioned. They, they teach absolute truth and you must not question that. Then there's loaded language, so the cult develops its own language that um, have terms, like, so these are like trigger terms. So if you talk to a Jehovah's Witness, uh, you often won't understand a lot of words. Like when, you, when they talk about what a pioneer is, it's completely different than the dif dictionary definition or when they talk about uh, organisation, it has special meanings to them. Then there's uh, doctrine over person, where the, uh, the good of the group is better than the good of the individual. And then salvation, uh, dispensing of existence, where you can only be saved if you're in that particular group. Now, I, I think it's actually a lot simpler than this. I think there's just two things that really define whether a religion is dangerous, and that is environment control. If they restrict your access to uh, other points of view and then shun you, and particularly if they shun you when you leave, and then if you cannot question the leaders, then that is going to be a religion that's uh, dangerous. And really it comes down even uh, more simply, uh, Stephen Hassan says that if you ask a religion whether they shun former members, and they say yes, then you immediately know that that is basically a damaging high control religion. Um, Stephen Hassan, who I just mentioned, he's one of the current leading uh, uh, anti-cult activists. And he's come up with a very, uh, very easy way to, to try and work out whether something is uh, being manipulated, and that's the bite method. So when they control your behaviour, when they control the information you have access to, uh, your thought control and emotional control, then uh, that's how you, uh, you use coercive manipulation. And certainly with, uh, with Jehovah's Witnesses, there's a lot of uh, behaviour control. They have very rigid rules around even things that are conscious matters about whether you can have a beard or not, how you have your hair, whether you can have tattoos, what movies you go to, what music you like, what sort of dancing you can do, uh, whether you can gamble or smoke or vote, all these things. There's so many, even sexual intimacies, uh, holidays, entertainment, all of these things are actually regimented. And then there's also large demands on time because when you're completely uh, involved with the religion, it gives you little time to think about other things and, and to actually reevaluate your life. Jehovah's Witnesses are expected to preach on a weekly basis and then sub submit a report uh, once a month to be considered a Jehovah's Witness. There's uh, information control. So you have to avoid apostate inform information at all costs. Uh, they discourage people going to university. And then there's um, deception within the Watcher articles, uh, like I mentioned about when it talks about earthquakes. So here's a... Here's a uh, quote from the Watchtower, it says, false religious propaganda from any source should be avoided like poison. Really, since our Lord has used the faith and the street slave to convey to us sayings of everlasting life, why would you ever want to look anywhere else? So they really say that you're getting everything you need from them, don't go research from elsewhere. There's also thought control, um, and this is where you are to, they discourage discussion about points. And um, so this, this uh, watchtower says, a mature Christian does not advocate or insist on personal opinions or harbour private ideas when it comes to Bible understanding. Rather, he has complete confidence in the truth as it is revealed by Jehovah God through his son, Jesus Christ, and the faithful and discreet slave. So um, Ray Franz, who wrote a, a book about the religion, says that any persons among Jehovah's Witnesses who find they cannot conscientiously support fully the organisation's teachings or practices live in a climate of fear, feeling they must constantly be on guard as to what they say, what they do, what they read, with whom they associate, from whom they receive letters, not feeling any sense of freedom, even amongst personal friends or close relatives, if these are witnesses. So when you're a witness, you cannot talk about any doubts that you have because uh, that then leads to being labelled apostate, which is really the greatest of all sins. And then there's uh, emotional control. And uh, emotional control is fear, obligation and guilt. So religions thrive on using these to manipulate members. So the, uh, the, the Watchtower is always talking about how we need to, we can't take it easy, you need to be exerting yourself vigorously if you're going to have any chance of surviving Armageddon. And um, it talks about the world, this is, uh, this is how they view the world. It says, while some contact with worldly people is unavoidable at work, at school and otherwise, we must be vigilant so as to keep from being sucked back into the death-dealing atmosphere of this world. Let the world go on its way, reaping its bad food fruitage in the form of broken homes, illegitimate births, sexually transmitted diseases such as AIDS and countless other emotional and physical woes. 
So a witness is always in fear of like what the world is like. Um, they're in fear that they're not doing enough work, and so they always have uh, guilt that they're not um, not doing enough. And so that is why um, it it controls them to always doing more. And so you just don't have time then to be sort of getting out and doing uh, normal things and researching. And, and this is how they control you within it. But all of that still doesn't really explain why um, why it's so hard for someone to leave. It's it's how you are controlled. But there's another factor. Uh, which is called cognitive dissonance. And that, this really helps us uh, to understand why it is that people cannot leave uh, their beliefs. So um, many church witnesses know of the, the wrong doctrine, the changed doctrine, they know the failed prophecies, and yet they still believe it is the truth. And this uh, Festinger, Leon Festinger, did research into a UFO occult to explain how this is. And this cult had said that there was going to be a UFO come in the 50s and all the world was going to be destroyed and these 16 members were going to be saved in that UFO. So when it didn't come, you would think that they would leave, but they, they didn't. And they continued to preach and they continued to say that they had been right. Uh, so very similar to what the witnesses in 1914. So basically cognitive dissonance means that you retain perceptions that conflict and then this causes mental stress. So people will believe something that they know is wrong to prevent this stress. So, for instance, if a um, if a witness accepts all these bad, these are uh, wrong things, but then they think if they if that's actually correct and it's not the truth, they have to leave. Then they have to put up with this uh, concept that they're going to die at Armageddon and that they're going to lose their friends. And so there's this huge stress always going on about I know these things don't sound right, but I've got to show them because otherwise I'm going to be putting myself out here and going through all of this, uh, uh, this great loss in my life. So um, Festinger said, a man with a conviction is a hard man to change. Tell him you disagree and he turns away. Show him facts or figures and he questions your sources. Appeal to logic and he fails to see your point. Now the other point that Festinger also makes is that if um, when something actually does go wrong, the way to sort of um, help your mind and when, when you're having this dissonance is actually to associate with other people in the group. If there's other people that agree with you, then you think, oh no, I, it, it must be right. And then to further uh, get rid of cognitive dissonance is to preach and convert people. So if you can convert people, then you must be right. And so if other people can believe it, then you're right. And so cognitive dissonance is what stops people being honest with themselves. And it's also what motivates people to try and get other people to join these cults. Now the impact on leaving is great. You, um, when you leave, you lose your family, you lose your friends. If you have a business or work for witnesses, you lose your income, you lose your belief, you lose your purpose, and you lose your feeling of elitism. So this is uh, what was something uh, was written by another person that belonged to a different cult, and they said, you think you are the van in the vanguard of history. You have been called out of the anonymous masses to assist the Messiah. As the chosen, you are above the law. They have arrived at the humbling and exalted, exalting conclusion that, that they are more valuable to God, to history, and to the future than any other people. So this is common across cults, that they actually believe that they are extremely special and elite, and they are saving the world, and certainly Jehovah's Witnesses believe that. And so to leave uh, the religion and accept that it's not true, you lose that, uh, that incredible purpose that you have in life. And so what happens is that you uh, no doubt will go then through the uh, five stages of grieving, and I certainly went through this, where you start off trying to de deny that it certainly it must be the truth, and you're trying to deny uh, all the information you find. You then get angry at uh, having been lied to, and you start bargaining. Like for me, I bargained for many years of going to the, keep going to the meetings just so I could see my family. Then uh, you end up going through depression, and finally you get through that, and you have acceptance. And so it is possible to get through that and then go on living uh, really meaningful and happy lives. But uh, when faced with so much to lose, it's no wonder that many people just uh, uh, face cognitive dissonance and bury their heads in the sand. And certainly I'd have to say that's about my family. So, that's where we're going to have a break now. Um, so what, I actually, where are we going to have a break or go on a bit more? Have a break, but so then uh, later, then I'll come back and just run through you know, some of the things that I think are the more damaging aspects of the religion, and particularly the uh, the Royal Commission and what happened with that with uh, the child abuse as well.
Uh, the coercion, the manipulation, and how that is done um, as uh, one of Jehovah's Witnesses. Now I have to come back to this topic because this is uh, is just a it's just a uh, truly evil practice, um, shunning, and the uh, the effect it's had on lives is is incredibly terrible. So there's about 40 different reasons for which a uh, Jehovah's Witness can be disfellowshipped. So it's a, a form of shunning, or a form of control that's very common amongst totalitarian groups. Um, and it's a, a, a very destructive practice that affects a, a lot of people. In fact, there's over a million Jehovah's Witnesses that are alive that are in a state of being disfellowshipped at the moment. And so when you consider how many people that affects, because that affects all of their family as well, who quite uh, uh, mostly will be Jehovah's Witnesses as well, there's actually millions of people that are being affected, affected by this practice. So the, um, the Principles of Psychology, a book, uh, notes, No more fiendish punishment could be devised if such a thing were physically possible than that one should be turned loose into society and remain absolutely unnoticed by all the members thereof. If no one turned around when we entered, answered when we spoke or minded what we did, but if every person we met cut us as dead and acted as if we were non-existent things, a kind of rage and an impotent despair would before long well up in us. So I know that feeling from personal experience. I, uh, I was at, a, um, at an event once and there were some witnesses there and so I was holding my son and one of my friends walked up to me, started talking to Zach and then walked away and didn't actually didn't acknowledge my existence at all. I've been walking along the street where people have crossed the, the road walked into shops where people have literally ran out of the shop. It's like I'm walking around with a bell, like leper, leper. So um, for those who are trying to get reinstated into the religion, you have to attend meetings for at least six months, and it can go on for years, where you come in late, you sit at the back of the hall and you leave, you're not allowed to be spoken to. And this is a watchtower illustration, and see how it shows the, uh, the shunned person there, how uh, miserable she looks because everyone is having their warm fellowship and she's um, not allowed to be spoken to. So you have to go through that for at least six months before you can come back in. So shunning um, a family though is what really makes uh, this fellowship truly evil. To, to actually tell parents that they must not speak to their children is, uh, is incredible. And to tell uh, children that they cannot speak to their parents is equally evil as well. Um, at the core of society, uh, the, is our family. In the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Article 12 states, no one should be subjected to arbitrary interference with his privacy, family, home or correspondence, nor to attacks upon his honour and reputation. So I believe that the Watchtower contravenes this, uh, this right. But this, um, I've got a, commit, a, a video I want to show you. Unfortunately, this was a sort of bootleg one, so the quality is not very good. Uh, the sound, but it is truly uh, horrible uh, when you when you watch how uh, Jehovah's Witnesses are supposed to treat their shunned shunned um, relatives. And this this was actually played in uh, 2016 at the convention. So they've gone to a whole new level of, uh, of manipulation by being having these very slick uh, movies that they're playing to people. But I'm going to skip through it because it's quite long. <laughs> My mouse has disappeared. I'll just, um, I'll just start from the end. He said, basically, this is a story of a girl and she mentioned how she had turned her back on Jehovah and she had uh, found a boyfriend and she thought her boyfriend was more important than Jehovah and she then did things that she uh, regretted, was sorry for, um, or, but she didn't regret it soon enough and was disfellowshipped. And so then it has in this video clip how the parents are supposed to treat her. in order to show the entire nation that they supported Jehovah's judgment. Mom and Dad saw that they needed to be loyal, just like Aaron. They loved me and wanted me to come back to Jehovah. I tried to contact them. I just wanted to talk and to hear their voice. 
I missed being with my family. And they thought about reaching out to me. But they knew that if they had associated with me, even a little, just to check on me, that small dose of association might have satisfied me. It could have made me think that there was no need to return to Jehovah. I think that's disgusting. So basically, that's horrible too. Basically, they um, it's total blackmail. Again, the parents have to never answer the phone from their their child there because by not answering the phone, the child will uh, want to come back to Jehovah, which is completely garbage because they're obviously not coming back to Jehovah. They're coming back to the religion because they want their parents to talk to them. So uh, the next uh, next point that uh, is quite horrific about Jehovah's Witnesses is the amount of death and suffering that it causes. So they pride themselves on the organisation of the individual and that Jehovah's Witnesses do not abandon Christian principles trying to save their present life. So one of the most uh, distressing of, uh, of, of any experience with Jehovah's Witnesses is what happened in Malawi. So Malawi is a uh, one... One, uh, was a uh, one-party state, and you had to hold the uh, the party card. And uh, the what the governing body said that you could not hold this uh, this card because that would be politically political involvement. Now, this is just a, such a, a, a ridiculous concept because Jesus said, "Pay back Caesar's things to Caesar." You can pay taxes, you can be involved with politics. They just very ignorantly define what politics is. So because of this. Um, and I'm not justifying what the Malawi, Malawi, Malawi <laughs> what, what happened to these uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, but there was uh, thousands of them were raped and tortured, displaced, sent uh, into other countries and murdered. And so they were dying because they were following a rule that the governing body had stated that doesn't actually make any doctrinal sense. But what makes this even more tragic is that at the very same time in Mexico, the governing body determined that it was allowed for the Jehovah's Witnesses to bribe officials to get a card to say that they had served in the military when they actually hadn't. So they were on one hand, some countries were allowed to be bribing political officials, and on the other hand they were getting tortured to death for it. So this is where you see that um, the, just this horrible way of um, misinterpreting things is, just leads to unnecessary suffering. The next uh, terrible thing is, uh, is uh, some of the medical advice. So the Golden Age was just an incredibly embarrassing piece of um, literature that was uh, printed before coming into the awake that was just filled with... Uh, they made all sorts of crazy uh, statements about how you should sleep, whether you should, uh, that you weren't allowed to eat before lunchtime because it was bad for you. Um, many many uh, very ignorant statements. And so you can see they really have very little uh, medical knowledge that they then happen to decree upon. One thing that they said during the 70s is that in, in the early, uh, late 60s, they said uh, that transplants are cannibalism. And then in 1982 or three, they said that transplants are fine. So they, you can see they don't have God directing them. They flip-flop around on the doctrine. And yet for those years, people were dying that could have been saved from transplants. Now, the, uh, the next thing then is blood. And blood transfusions were actually allowed uh, for many, many decades by Jehovah's Witnesses. And then, they have this uh, this revolution that apparently blood transfusions are, are unchristian. And again, it's an extremely ignorant way that they've uh, interpreted the Bible around that. And um, But because of this, they have now led to absolutely uh, tens of thousands of deaths. In fact, there's hundreds of people dying every year avoiding blood transfusions. And the Watchtower actually uh, boasts about it. They, they uh, have this... This uh, way came out where they boast about the thousands of young, young, or the thousands of youths that died for putting God first. So some think that they are proud of that they, they are having uh, their own followers dying by not having blood transfusions. And what stuns me about this is that if you hear about uh, <coughs> the Branch Davidians, where there was 80 of them died in 1993 in a massacre, people were just horrified. There was a uh, Hundreds of people died in Jonestown in 1978, and people are, to this day, uh, drinking the Kool-Aid is part of our, our language. And yet there's hundreds of Jehovah's Witnesses dying every year because of the blood transfusion issue, and it just doesn't get any attention at all. <coughs> the, uh, throughout the years, there's been tens of thousands of Jehovah's Witnesses put into jail uh, because they weren't allowed to do military service, 
And then in 1996, the watchtower goes, oh, military service is actually fine now. And so you're, it's a conscious matter and you're allowed to do military service. And so here with tens of thousands of people that suffered in jail for something that obviously wasn't even a, a Christian thing. And then, and then like to rub salt into the wound there, in 1998 they said that some people might find this a bit offensive, but the people that uh, had gone to jail apparently rejoiced that they had the opportunity of demonstrating publicly and clearly that they were determined to be firm on the issue of universal sovereignty. So they can backflip on the doctrine and then justify it without any apology. Also, uh, they don't like to uh, plan for the future because there is no future. The end is about to happen soon. And so in uh, May 1974, just before 1975, they said that, uh, that people were selling their houses so that they could go pioneering in these last few uh, months and years of the world. So those people uh, lost everything and it never came. I actually got a, an experience uh, emailed to me where the, the son was in, um, the father sold everything, got a caravan and they were driving through the American uh, forests trying to hide from Armageddon in 75 and also how much he was being beaten because God was saying, it, his father saying, I need to make you survive Armageddon. So this, uh, there's absolutely no, um, there's little thought for the, for the future because there, there shouldn't be. And so um, part of that is to say that you shouldn't get an advanced education because going to university, for one thing, opens people's minds to uh, on how to actually think and, and evaluate information, but also it's a waste of time when you should be out preaching and, and growing the religion. They talk about um, planning for the future with uh, marriage and children as well. And because we're so close to the end, you shouldn't have children. And there actually is many children, so this isn't like a hard and fast rule. But there is, a, particularly during periods when there's this heightened expectation of Armageddon, they start talking about how it would be advisable not to have children. And this book's from 1930s, I think, uh, where they said there's only a few more months before Armageddon and not to have children. And these people have grown old and, and missed out on... Um, you know, children and grandchildren, great-grandchildren probably since then. And even in 2016, they still made the comment, thousands of young men and women are willingly sacrificing marriage or are not having children, at least for now, in order to serve Jehovah to the full. So they're still trying to encourage people to put the, uh, basically growing the religion ahead of uh, their own lives and family. Now, one, um, one of the great ways of manipulating people is through fear, and certainly the churches have uh, excelled at that over the years. And I used to think that the Catholic Church was, uh, was probably worse. I think that that is as powerful a fear as what Jehovah's Witnesses use, because that's something, yeah, it's distant, it doesn't really relate. It's the fear of what's happening to you now, what's going to happen to you. Yes, as I was saying, I, I had this, uh, this fear of the, the people putting... Uh, pins under my fingernails. I was going to put a picture up, but it was so horrific that I couldn't even uh, subject you to that. And the um, the other thing, I was I'm extremely ticklish, and I used to think that uh, I would get tickled until I suffocated at Armageddon. And and I used to think that because Satan could probably read my mind, but he hadn't thought about that how I was ticklish, and Satan would know, and so he would use that to torture me. And um, and here you see now that they're still using the same techniques of fear. Look at the, the fear in that girl's face. Uh, fear that the uh, people are coming to, to get them at the Great Tribulation there. One, uh, one person wrote an experience, he goes, when I was a kid and I lost my first tooth, I laid awake in bed at night wondering if I would die in Armageddon because of the blood I had swallowed. Kids shouldn't be afraid of crap like that. Now uh, here's uh, another video, hopefully this is easier to get going than the other one. Um, this is just... Uh, I'll just let you, you watch it because I can't believe that this is the type of, of uh, stuff that they are showing at conventions for people now. So this is supposed to be during the Great Tribulation while they're waiting there for um, just before Armageddon. And your faith has led you here as loyal servants of Jehovah, confident that Psalm 97 verse 10 applies to you personally. Jehovah is guarding the lives of his loyal ones. Where are they? Shut the basement. Shut that door.
Never go for retard. So yeah, I just think that is just absolutely terrible. Like how this, how powerful that um, that is. Uh, just the way they have the music and this uh, this total fear of what is going to happen. It got even worse. Like there's another video I'm not going to show where they have the child dying and um, being resurrected when they get into the new system. And so you have everyone in the convention is absolutely just overwhelmed with emotions. Um, and that is how you manipulate people. Now uh, I, I told you about uh, the fear of Armageddon and. I showed you the picture that I had in a book, and you would think that we've come so far as human beings, uh, the research into how, how people should behave, that, uh, that hopefully Jehovah's Witnesses would have learned from that, and the Bible story books would be uh, you know, uh, kinder and gentler and, and, and nicer. So let's see what the, uh, the latest book for, for children says. So I have a nice picture here. It says, why should we not just be thinking about having fun? And so the very next picture following this is even worse than the picture that I had to uh, had to look at. So this is in the Bible series book called Learn from the Great Ch Teacher, chapter 46. And you can see the absolute horror on these people's faces as the horsemen of the apocalypse and then uh, the uh, Jesus on his white horse come raining fire down and uh, murdering billions of people throughout the world. So this is, this is what children are subjected to as Jehovah's Witnesses. Now, I, I do think the, uh, the negative view of life as well has quite an effect where you just have to constantly be convincing yourself about how evil everything is to justify why the end is about to come and you alone will survive. Uh, I see there's a few women here. So the next, this, this is actually uh, should be infuriating to, uh, to the, the women here. The view of women, I mean, the Bible is obviously very um, misogynistic. And if you look at the, the Old Testament where women were basically possessions of men, um, but, uh, the witnesses have, have sort of moved on a little bit from that, as have most uh, Christian religions, but not, not as far as they definitely should have come. You still see in illustrations the traditional 1950s Stepford wife photo of her doing the, uh, the cooking while uh, the husband's off there doing Bible study or something in the corner. Then uh, women, because they are not equal to men uh, and lesser than men, then if they have to pray in front of a man or if they have to pray in front of other women when there's no man, they have to have a head covering to rem remind themselves of being lesser, lesser beings. And so uh, often I remember being a child when I was there because I was present but I was a man but I wasn't baptised. They had to wear a head covering and so often it would be a, a serviette or a tea towel. So it was hardly giving glory to God or to themselves. And this, this brother here, he's the first uh, black African um, member of the governing body. So all the members have been white males and uh, mostly uh, American or European. So he's the first uh, African-American one, which is good that there's a little bit of progression in that regard. But uh, this is what he uh, said in, uh, the, in the 70s. This is from one of his talks that I have a recording of. He said, you know, scientists say that the cranial capacity of a woman is 10% smaller than that of a man. So now this shows that she's just not equipped for the role of headship. Her role is one of subjection to the man. Her role is that of submissiveness, and that means that she should recognise that she is a woman. Be glad to be a woman. Never want to be what you are not equipped to be. So, so, so if you're a, a feminist uh, sister, it's no doubt quite hard. And then the... Um, this is, a, so this is really old, old fashioned, so it's not their current teaching, but they, they did write in the Golden Age that whether the identity of the sexes as such will be preserved, we do not know. There has been some well authenticated instances in which women have been transformed into men, and it is possible that this transformation may become general and we shall all be brothers together. So, that would be, be a fun, fun new system for all eternity. <laughs> um, the, uh, the concept of never growing old and dying is extremely destructive, I, in, in my personal opinion. Um, it's incomprehensible, I think, to most people to think that humans are supposed to live forever on this planet. Uh, incredibly boring as well, if you, if you understand that this is for infinity. Like This is forever and ever and ever and ever, and it never ends. You are confound to this earth. And you can't have uh, children, obviously. And that was one of the other things with that last picture of, of paradise. It won't be children because the earth will be filled, so you can't have children. So um, it would just be a you know, quite a, a mundane thing. But the, the the effect it has on your life in not thinking that you're going to die is you, you don't get emotionally prepared for that. So for me at 35 to suddenly have to accept that I was actually going to die 
I just uh, even now I can't get my head around the fact that I will be uh, will, will die, and um, I'm not sure how other normal people think. Uh, cope with death. Uh, certainly, I think that uh, having that upbringing is it really affects how you can deal with uh, death. And also, because you don't think you're going to die, you don't plan for the future and old age. And then we also we already read some quotes about worldly people, and so this is basically what worldly people are and why uh, they deserve to be destroyed at Armageddon, and why they should be, uh, why we should guard, this is here, why we should guard ourselves against them, those worldly people playing on Playstations, it's a terrible game. <laughs> so, um, but one of the, the uh, most tragic consequences of, oh, of our being, uh, of, of what's happening with the watch at the moment is uh, regarding child abuse, and so, I'm just going to run through now what happened with the Australian Royal Commission um, into the institutional response to child abuse, and this has been running since 2013. Now, you would think that a religion that says that uh, sex or fornication, sex outside of marriage is wrong, would not have a problem with, um, with uh, child abuse, and especially when you're told that you will, you will die uh, at Armageddon if you, you know, uh, do fornication or abuse children, and certainly Jehovah's Witnesses themselves are, are find it absolutely abhorrent. And yet, there's this huge uh, issue of it within the uh, the Watchtower organisation, and that's uh, been coming to light lately. And uh, so, I'm going to run through why this is and what the findings of the Royal Commission have been. And because of uh, because of how much of uh, of what is happening. Uh, Watchtower Society is paying out millions of dollars every year in court cases and there is a whole string of them coming at the moment, like the floodgates are only just opening. Um, and so you, they've started advertising in New York now that there's been some precedents set uh, that uh, on TV and also in the newspapers for uh, people that were abused as Jehovah's Witnesses and had it covered up to come forward. Um, so when, when, a, when a child reports a case of abuse, the logical thing would be that you should go to the authorities, go to people who have been trained to deal with that and let them handle it. For the Watchtower Society, they don't want, um, they don't want things to get out into the open, and so they instruct the elders that they must handle these things internally, and this is what's causing uh, the problems. In uh, Australia, we don't have uh, the, uh, the, there's no law that you have to uh, um, take a, a report of accusation to the police. So the uh, Watchtower hasn't been breaking any laws around that, that regard when they hear an accusation and don't go to the police. But certainly they, you would think they should have an ethical responsibility around that at least. And also it would just be logical to try and get assistance in something that's such a tragic and difficult uh, area. So there's, there's three primary reasons why Watchtower has been trying to keep these problems internal. One is uh, the two witness rule. The other one is their mistrust of the world, and thirdly is a reproach upon Jehovah's name. So I'm going to run through what each of these mean. So there's a, um, there's a scripture in Matthew 18, 15 and 16 that says, At the mouth of two or three witnesses, every matter must be established. And this, uh, this is a quote from the Old Testament that's quoted about three times in the New Testament. And so the Watchtower says that the Bible says that there must be two or three witnesses before judicial action can be taken. They also have this concept that a legal crime is not a scriptural crime. So it doesn't matter what the law finds, uh, until, unless their internal processes find that to be a scriptural crime, then it doesn't apply. So with the two witness rule, in the 1990s, you had to have two witnesses to every single, uh, every, every case that you were going to um, uh, have. So even if someone's smoking, you can't just disfellowship someone for smoking unless two people have seen it and dobbed the person in. So they also enforce this with children. So if you haven't got two witnesses watching a child being abused, the elders were not to do anything. So not only do they not report the accusation, they don't actually even do anything at all. And so obviously a pedophile does not molest a child in front of other people. So there's never, almost never, two witnesses. And so this meant that pedophiles could just go working through congregations knowing that they will never, ever get, get brought to justice. Frederick MacLean, for 26 years, or 23 years, um, molested numerous children despite numerous children going to the elders and saying what had happened. They, he was allowed to just continue operating throughout the congregations. In uh, 2002, uh, 
due to a lot of uh, legal pressure coming onto them in court cases, they finally changed the two witness rule. So here they say they can't change the two witness rule because it's what the Bible says. They did change the two witness rule. It says now that you need two people uh, to two separate events can be considered two witnesses. So now if a second child comes forward, then that's considered two, uh, two cases. And so you still have uh, this issue of... I should have had up there. And about this issue is that you can have a, a know that somebody's molested a child and do nothing about it and have to wait for the second one to come forward. So it still, is a, it still doesn't make any sense. So it's an inadequate um, change there. Now the, the thing is that this is a really shocking interpretation of the two witness rule anyway. And at the Royal Commission, um, they actually brought up that the Jehovah's Witnesses don't apply this rule consistently anyway. So in cases of rape, you don't need two witnesses. Um, and also that scripture is talking about adults. It was not applied to children because it was about adults that could talk about their problems to each other. And then if it didn't work out, then they had two witnesses. So they're misinterpreting a scripture and then allowing children to suffer because of that. Now the other, other reason they don't like to go to the go to um, worldly people is because of their view of worldly people. So they do not trust the, uh, the authorities. They don't trust that the police and the uh, people that are specialists in different areas uh, have their best interests in mind. So they tell us that God has nothing in common with the world. Worldly people are existing as slaves of corruption. The, um, with the authorities, they say that um, well-intentioned practitioners are given advice that flatly contradicts the Bible. So when the Royal Commission came up, you could see this was the, the attitude that they had. So they, the, uh, the legal team just could not accept that the Royal Commission had their best interests in heart. They could not believe that the, uh, the authorities in how to deal with uh, uh, child abuse would know more than what God has told them through the Bible. And then finally, they don't like to bring reproach on Jehovah's name. So they don't want people, Jehovah's Witnesses, going to the authorities because they don't want the authorities to know that they actually have internal problems because that would make Jehovah look bad. And the ironic thing about this is because they haven't been going to the authorities, that is what makes Jehovah look bad, or at least Jehovah's Witnesses. So this has totally backfired on them. So... In uh, 2013, the uh, Royal Commission into Institutional Responses to Child Sexual Abuse was started. This is Justice McLennan. He's, uh, he's amazing, extremely smart. You can see he's very compassionate as well. And, and that is why I found it quite interesting that the witnesses did not like really respect that it was in their own benefit. I mean, the, uh, the people involved were just so professional about it. Now, um, I had the honour of meeting uh, Andrew Stewart, who was and actually uh, talking quite a lot to him. Uh, and he was also incredibly intelligent, had a great knowledge about the, the way witnesses uh, operate, the, uh, the Watchtower operates uh, in this regard. Um, I also spoke to, to a, lot of, uh, a lot of people there, some of the lawyers, a lot of the people in the audience, and they said that out of all the 56 different um, groups, institutions that were examined, the, uh, Justice McLennan took umbrage to two groups, and that was the Catholic Church and Jehovah's Witnesses, because they were the two religions that just dogmatically really didn't didn't care, they did not want to be spoken down to um, by the, the authorities. They are God's people, they don't answer to anyone. Um, now, it's, what's important to recognise is that the Commission wasn't actually formed to sue anyone, it wasn't formed to assign blame to anyone, it was simply looking at how institutions have been dealing with child abuse and then to advise these institutions on what best practice is so that this doesn't happen in the future. So. Um, that was sorely missed by the Watchtower leaders who went into the proceedings totally ill-prepared, worried more about the reputation of the organisation and uh, just did not want to hear how the Commission could actually help them in improve their policies. So these are the, um, some of the key people that were involved and these are people that are very, very <coughs> close to me. So I was actually speaking to Rodney Spinks's brother yesterday. So Rodney. Uh, was involved in dub dobbing his sister in for fornication 35 years ago and hasn't spoken to his sister for 35 years. And he's one of the head guys uh, at Bethel and involved in this case. Vin Tool, he was a mentor of mine at Bethel. So he was going through university when I was at Bethel and I actually bought him a, a graduation gift. Um, uh, what's his name? <laughs> <laughs> Jeffrey Jackson. So, He's one of the governing bodies, so he's one of the seven leaders of the religion at the moment. So he's, uh, 
His father-in-law studied with me for 10 years as a teenager, it was the person that I had to confess to and also um, went through my baptism process with. And I knew him very, very well. And he's, a, he's, very, uh, he's very smart, he's a, a great comedian, um, and he's one of the leaders there. And Terry O'Brien spoke at my father's funeral four years ago and is the coordinator of the other uh, branch committee. So these are people I really know intensely, I uh, really know well. And I was just shocked at how they responded and how dishonest they were throughout the proceedings. Um, the, in, at the end of it all, the, uh, there's been a, a public a, a report re released by the, um, by the courts there, and it makes some really, really interesting observations about how Jehovah's Witnesses are handling um, sex abuse amongst their... Uh, uh, their congregations, and it, it mentions here that the organisation relies on outdated policies and practices wholly inappropriate and unsuitable for application in cases of child sexual abuse. It is not child or survivor focused. It's presided over by males. The internal disciplinary system is weak. Serious, they have a serious lack of understanding of the nature and impact of child sex abuse. And there is a failure by the organisation to provide for the safety and protection of children in the organisation and in the community. So Jehovah's Witnesses, even though they are pedophiles, known pedophiles, are still supposed to go door knocking. So they come knocking on your doors, knowing uh, who's home and where and when, and there's no uh, sanctions over that. They, they surely it would make sense to go, maybe you guys, uh, maybe you shouldn't be going um, door knocking. Like, you, to actually allow them to go out and, and put them in or children in, in harm's way in the community as well doesn't help there. They also made a very interesting observation. It says, uh, it is conceivable if not likely that a survivor's entire family and social network comprise members of the Jehovah's Witness organisation. The survivor of child sexual abuse may therefore be faced with an impossible choice between staying in an organisation which is protective of their abuser in order to retain their social and familial network and leaving the organisation and, and losing that entire network as a result. So these children that have abu been abused then basically have the choice of either way suffering for the rest of their lives even more so than they needed to. So I, I expected that this was going to be a, a good outcome. I thought that there was this really, if Jehovah's Witnesses were confronted with this information, only good could come from it. Either that they were gonna go, this is absolutely um, terrible, we absolutely have to do something about it, or they'd say, how can I be part of an organization that is so obviously not guided by a loving God, that obviously do not have a child's best interests at heart and leave. And what has happened is that hasn't happened at all. The organisation has just gone, we do not want to listen to your advice, you do not tell us what Jehovah wants us to do. And the, um, the witnesses that hear about it, they just think it's all, it's all lies and it's from apostates. So there's uh, not very many of them that actually had any, had, had any great effect on it all. What I'm um, really disappointed about is with Vin Tool. Uh, he is aware of the amount of abuse going on in Australia. He knows uh, what the practices are. He's, he's an intelligent person that's been given advice as to what, um, uh, what they should do. And I know several people that are very close to him that uh, have said that he just thinks that this is all an apostate orchestrated attack. So it doesn't matter that uh, the Royal Commission was set up not to investigate them, it was set up to investigate 56 different churches and it's come up with findings of all 56 that are quite damning of, of most of them, if not all of them. Uh, that doesn't matter. This is Satan attacking us, it's apostates attacking us, it doesn't apply to us and it's not fair. So even their lawyer, like their, you know, the top brains in the organisation, they're refusing to accept any responsibility. Uh, fortunately though, uh, there is an, a, a slight effect, not as much as I wanted, but this year there was a appropriate number, 66689 Jehovah's Witnesses, and of that, uh, that's 64 less than the year before. Now when you take into account that there was 1,235 baptised this year, that means after taking into account the death rate that there's around about 1,000 uh, Chiovas witnesses that left over the last year and so hopefully uh, part of that is from the fact that the, the Royal Commission has tweaked uh, some of them. Actually if you look at here as well you can see uh, that the growth, this is very similar around a lot of the world, there's a lot of growth in the 80s uh, of witnesses and then it sort of flatlined and it hasn't really been going anywhere since uh, a few things such as the internet came around in the 1990s. 
So I'm going to move on uh, to the final topic, or almost the final topic, called helping someone leave. So I went through a conundrum when I, when I left. I had all this information that made me convinced that this was not the truth. I, I was convinced that it does more harm than good. But, and I was excited. I wanted to out tell everybody about it. But is it my place to ruin someone else's faith? A lot of Jehovah's Witnesses really like being Jehovah's Witnesses. They got their nice circle of friends there, and they're often trustworthy friends. They have this incredible mission in this most auspicious of times. We've covered also that when you leave, you go through so much tragedy. There's so much loss. It's like, is it worth finding out about this? Isn't it better just to live in this fool's paradise and at least have this sort of nice little circle and, and not have to go through the loss? And so was it my place to affect other people's faith? And um, the further cause is my concern about people finding out my information and committing suicide. So I've had a number of my friends commit suicide, uh, both while they were church witnesses and also after leaving. And so the process of leaving can be far more than some people can, can bear. And so did I want to be take the risk that I was going to trigger some of that in people by having uh, my, my sight? <clears throat> but I am convinced, as I've shown you, that I think it does more harm than it does good. And um, the internet has been crucial um, around, around helping people because the, uh, the information that you get there makes you be able to go through this, this, uh, this transition rapidly. Rather than being just thinking that you're, you're all alone and that no one else is going through the same as you, you now know uh, what to expect, how many other people are going through it. You can prepare for it and do it in a, in a, a logical way and actually can leave with far less scars than uh, maybe in the 80s before you had these support groups. The internet also support provides a lot of online support groups that you can get information on and you can strategize about how you're going to extract yourself with the most uh, or the least least harm. So I get emails daily from people and uh, almost universally they are always that they are grateful that they found out. Like they might admit that they've gone through tremendous suffering but they always say that they are ha happy that they knew. People don't want to be kept uh, in the dark. People don't want to be ignorant. And so people are happier when they find out uh, what it is and, that, that, and when they leave. And um, yeah, even, it doesn't matter about the struggle, like, you really want to know that you're living a life that's based on, uh, on honesty. So then, how do you help someone leave? And we've already uh, talked about how cognitive dissonance does make it really, really difficult. And you need to know that there is no silver bullet. There is no thing that you can say. You might think you have the best point in the world, and you say, it's my killer point, and talk to, to someone, and then the day will uh, go, wow, that's amazing, you're, uh, you're a genius, I didn't realise that, I and leave. Well, that never, that never happens. It, it can't happen because Jehovah's Witnesses have an extremely solid doctrinal foundation, and they've come up with answers to every single thing that you can say to them. And so it's not, uh, not a matter of going, oh, did you ever think about this? It is a matter of chipping down and wearing down so that there's enough information that it finally creates a full picture. And then when they're emotionally ready, then they will make the, uh, the, uh, the choice of leaving. And it, is, uh, it, it normally takes a, this one, like I had probably three of these aha moments. It normally takes, when you're emotionally at the right time, and just that one straw that breaks the camel's back. And that's why it's good to talk to witnesses about whatever you think is an important point and it will build up over time. So when you ask somebody um, why they have left, there's invariably there's sort of three different areas. One is that they left for some emotional reasons and they thought that the elders weren't loving in their congregation, something like that. The other one is that uh, they leave for doctrinal reasons. They found out that uh, they actually uh, thought the doctrine that, they, that the witnesses teach is wrong and they've gone off to some other Christian uh, group. Or maybe they just find out that the, think that the Bible is, uh, is not infallible and they just leave for that reason. And then the other thing which is probably the most effective is scandal. So when witnesses find out about the duplicity of the organisation by being part of the United Nations or uh, covering up for pedophiles or um, you know, what they've done with Malawi and Mexico, those sort of things, the, the lies are in the, the magazines, that scandal is something that is often the most effective because to actually realise that these people are actually, the leaders are actually going out of their way to manipulate you and be dishonest with you is uh, a lot more con convincing than whether well, the doctrine's right or not. So every bit counts, though. So what the the most important thing 
if you want to have a conversation with a witness, is to ask them what's important to them. Why is it that they think that they have the truth? And it might be all three of those areas I just mentioned. There might be something that really is important to them, and then you know what's, what to concentrate on with them. So the key, uh, the key reasons is they normally think that, they, that the governing body is directed, that they have a unique lifestyle, and that the, uh, they have the true doctrine. So if you want to counter this uh, concept of being directed by Holy Spirit, you really do need to do a lot of research into this because you need to know a lot about the religion. And really the way to show that they're not directed by Holy Spirit is to show you had failed dates like 1914, or you flip-flopped on these different doctrines, um, or the history of how they took all their teachings uh, originally from the Second Adventist movement and then uh, changed them over time. So that's probably a bit much better for people who aren't really interested specifically in one religion to know. But that is uh, an effective... Uh, area, and that's what um, really helped me when I started doing my research. The other way is uh, looking at whether they're truly unique. And witnesses actually believe that they are the only loving religion, that their doctrine is uniquely accurate, that they're the only religion that don't go to war, and that they're the only religion with strict morals. Now, all of that is wrong. There are other religions that are pacifist, like the Brethren and the um, Anabaptists. There are other loving religions. In fact, every religion says they're loving because Jesus said that you, by this you'll know who his disciples are if they have love. They, uh, their doctrine is not unique. It was taken from the Second Adventist movement. And these other religions like the Seventh-day Adventists and also Christadelphians that are very, very similar to their, their doctrine. And they certainly don't have stricter morals than every other religion. You can look at other ones like the Brethren, etc. They also have uh, some very strict morals and abide very closely by them. So you need to sort of educate a witness that it is another religion. Uh, they don't like to be called a religion. They think uh, they're not a religion, they're a way of life. But it is just a religion and it's just like any other religion. And there are many other similar sects that follow the way that they act. Now the other thing is uh, if you want to discuss doctrine, I'd say don't. And uh, doctrine is like a tennis match. So you lob your favourite scripture over, their killer scripture, and then they lob their other one back and then you then counter it with this one and then they counter it back with the other one and um, the reason there's 35,000 Christian sects is that the Bible is not a book of doctrine the Bible has um, many many uh, different ideas about every single topic so you can't just go oh, let's look at Matthew chapter 1 and find out are we souls or not you have to pick random scriptures all through the Bible that all contradict each other and then say, well, this one over here is figurative and that one there is literal and this one's figurative and that's literal. So when you throw a scripture over and you say, see, this proves something, they go, oh, that's figurative. And then when you say to Jehovah's Witnesses, um, well, there is a burning hellfire because Revelation says such and such or Matthew says such and such, they go, oh, no, that was, uh, that was figurative. And so... But this one's literal, and so it's literally 144,000 in heaven. Now that teaching is going to change because there's been well over 144,000 people professing to be Christians in the first century and witnesses now. So now that they're growing again in number of partakers, well, eventually that will become figurative all of a sudden. So you can't win on doctrine. Um, so it's probably not worth trying to work out. So I've got here a look at the, uh, the atheist approach. It's, uh, you're an atheist here. There's, a, there's, two, um, there's two axioms that support the Watchtower uh, belief structure. And one of them is that the Watchtower is directed by God, or more specifically, the governing body is directed by God. The other one is that the Bible is infallible. So you can attack either axiom and it collapses the whole structure. So whether you can prove to someone the Bible is, uh, is not inspired or that the governing body are not uh, directed, either way, the whole lot... Uh, the whole lot crashes. And when I, when I created this, it wasn't for this um, this lecture. It was actually to, to show one of the effects of leaving, and that is that when you get either of those knocked out from under your belief system, you lose everything. You no longer know what you believe about morals. You no longer know what to believe about doctrine or history. You don't know anything about human relationships. You don't know how to plan for the future. Like everything that you thought you knew is meaningless. So that is why Jehovah's Witnesses can often act very immature. So for me, when I was 35, I had to suddenly reevaluate. I don't know, is smoking good? Is, you know, should I get drunk? What about uh, illegal drugs? Like everything that I should have uh, been playing around with and working out as a teenager, maybe not as a teenager, but like early 20s, <laughs> like I, I just uh, then started uh, far later in life. And, um, and so that is one of the effects of having had everything dictated to you. 
So for, uh, for an atheist, the, probably the best way to, to discuss something uh, with a witness is to talk about something that you may know and you are, you are actually knowledgeable about and passionate about. So you could start with uh, evolution. Uh, that's uh, an interesting topic. And Jehovah's Witnesses do not know about evolution. They are, t they are given uh, these propaganda books that are just full of the, the biggest amount of lies and, and myths and, and misinformation about what the actual evolution teaching is. In fact, Jehovah's Witnesses do not know what the word abiogenesis is. And you cannot have an intelligent conversation about evolution, and yet the watcher has never used that term. And so here it attacks uh, evolution as being ridiculous without ever actually defining evolution properly or defining that it's not abiogenesis. So uh, you can have a very interesting uh, conversation about that. The other, other thing that I think is, um, is more, one of my favourite topics is Noah's, Noah's Ark. It's, it is just uh, incredible that anyone in this day or age could actually believe that 4,000 years ago Mount Everest was covered in water, the whole world was covered in water, and that every single animal is because they can just go, oh yeah, it was just a, a myth, it's a, it's a story that doesn't have to actually destroy their faith. Um, and also, a lot of people, Christian religions, teach that it was a localised flood, that the way you interpret the word Eratz, etc., um, being the highest mountains were just the local hills, it wasn't expecting you to believe that it was all over every mountain, all over the world. And then the, um, the nice thing about marrying evolution and the flood together is that Witnesses say they don't believe in evolution and scoff at that whole concept. But if you believe in the, the flood story, you have to believe in an insanely rapid form of evolution that even scientists don't believe. Because the creationists say there were 16,000 uh, animal species that could fit on the ark. There's now 4 million animal species. So you've had to go from 16,000 to 4 million in 4,000 years, and you have to admit that you believe in evolution. So here's, uh, here's the uh, they watched our timeline. Here's the flood 4,300 years ago. Tower of Babel 2,000, uh, 100 years later. So somehow Adam and, not Adam and Eve, but Noah and his uh, little family, these eight people, had grown within 100 years to such a mighty nation that they had built, they had a huge city. They built a ziggurat that was at least 100 metres high out of Bronze Age tools. And there's so many of them that our God confused the languages. And all the languages that now exist today came from that period 4,000 years ago. So just even like there's so many little things in there that show it's completely um, crazy to think that any of this is other than anything other than just uh, like Sumerian-based myths. Now, um, a few techniques to think about. You need to try and concentrate on the Socratic method of asking questions. If you tell someone something, they're not going to believe it. You need to ask them and get them to admit it to you. You can't use apostate information. So unfortunately, you can't print a, a page off uh, jwfacts.com and say, look at these teachings. Uh, look at the, what it said about the uh, uh, Beth Say Rem, where they said in 1925, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob were going to get resurrected in California and live in the, the palatial house that Judge Rutherford was living in. Because um, they would just say that was lies, so you can't use apostate information. You would have to get them to, to source, if they could, some old publications and see that for themselves. You also need to stick to a single topic. You will find as soon as you bring up anything that uh, is remotely uh, challenging, they will either run for the door or they will change the topic. So you need to force them. We're not going to move on until we discuss this topic, because otherwise it's completely pointless. And you need to get a commitment. Um, I had a conversation with Stephen Lamb, my, uh, my cousin-in-law, and I told him that, that the studies in the scriptures, this is before I was this fellowship that I was just researching this, I said that the studies in the scriptures said that in 1914 the end was going to come, and he said, no, I never ever said that. I would never say that, that's wrong, so I wouldn't say that. I said, no, that's what it said, and they've changed it. He goes, no, that's impossible. So I said, oh, well, the studies in the scriptures are at the Kingdom Hall. So he drove down, got the... Uh, the book out, had a look at it, uh, came back and goes, oh yeah, they, they did say that, but it's uh, the light gets brighter. And so it had no effect on him at all. And so what I should have done is gone, uh, so you don't think it said that, so how would you feel if it said that? Like, make him lock in that point. Like, is that an important thing? Like, is it possible that they would, you know, would, would say something um, that was wrong? And then the more that he makes an important point, then when he actually, when he's committed to that point, then when he finds that it might have a bit more of an effect, he still would have said the light gets brighter, but it would be something that creates more cognitive uh, dissonance there, resonance there. So um, 
that that uh, that didn't really really help there, and, and he still hasn't left. But if I, I when I left, I just went out all guns blazing, and I just didn't think that you really need to take a very structured approach with uh, with the way you talk to people. And uh, also, what you'll find is when you are talking to a Jehovah's Witness, they will go like they they will go. Um, just bleary eyed, and it looks like you're talking to a robot. And so that is uh, what happens there is that when, when they start just uh, reciting information by rote, rather than thinking about stuff, that you will actually see it, it becomes like a robotic responses. So once, you're, once they get to that stage, you know you're wasting your, your time talking about it, because all that they are doing is reinforcing their own indoctrination, because they're not thinking about what you're saying, they're just parroting off the indoctrination that they've received. So if they, once you see this face shift in their eyes, you know that, oh, this, time to finish that conversation. The other, uh, I don't my picture. I love this, this picture. So this is uh, something that's really important if you meet like a young Jehovah's Witness that's grown up in the religion. So here they're, he's saying, so this is finally where our movement came along and got the Bible right. Like Jesus <laughs> is so lucky to have us. And that's Jehovah's Witnesses there right here on the end of that little chain as well. And so the, the topic that really, um, really struck with me is that I would never ever have been a Jehovah's Witness if I hadn't been raised one. And so you need to ask a, that, that child, like, do you know anything about other religions and what religion would you be? If you were born a Mormon and you started studying with Jehovah's Witnesses and found out that they uh, talked about 1914 and 1925 and they uh, used the, the length of the pyramids to support why 1914 was going to be the end, would you ever have left the Mormons that you've been indoctrinated to being true and moved to being a Jehovah's Witness? And I think very quickly you realise, no, and this is a, this quote here is spot on. It says, what religion a man shall have is, as, is a historical accident quite as much as what language he shall speak. And so the reason I speak English is not because it's the best language. The reason I speak English is because I wasn't born in Spain. And the reason I'm a Jehovah's Witness is because I wasn't born in Indonesia. It's, you, are, you are the religion that you are, the language that you speak is simply an accident of birth. It's got nothing to do with whether it's true or not. And I think that, that, that uh, when people that are born in the religion realise that, then it, it's a compelling argument for them. The other thing to do to know, though, that is if you actually cause someone to lose their faith in the religion, you also have a responsibility to look after them because you are going to absolutely destroy their life at that period of time and you need to be there to support them over that period where they, they come through that and so you need to be prepared to at least guide them to uh, XJ Dub support groups or get the, where, where are some online forums where they can talk to people or you know, monitor them to, them to see whether they should go to uh, therapy as well such as cognitive behavioural therapy because it is quite a responsibility uh, taking something away from someone who doesn't have anything to replace it with. Now I think the, uh, the ones that are the, the most important to target are the ones that are inactive but still believe. These are the ones that I feel absolute tragi tragedy about. And I have some friends like this that are in really bad places because they go through the whole life feeling like total failures and that they're going to die at Armageddon. And so if they have, have left because they committed fornication or got addicted to drugs or something but don't realise that it was they were part of a cult, for the rest of their lives they feel uh, this huge amount of guilt and shame and this huge fear of Armageddon. And so they're the ones that are the easiest to help get over because they're not getting this constant um, reinforcement and indoctrination, but often just have never had anyone even try to help them. So if you can help those ones, you've got the best chance of success and also you'll be doing the most good for someone because they need the, the help. You're not taking anything away, you're giving something back to them. And finally, just a few minutes, uh, I'm gonna move on to the next topic uh, about what next. <coughs> so the Watchtower, is like every single uh, religion out there and pretty much every organisation out there, it is motivated by money. It cannot survive without money. God doesn't need it and he doesn't give it either, so they have to make money themselves to survive. And the, the thing is now that the, um, the Watchtower is suffering greatly financially. They have huge uh, issues with cash flow. And uh, what's the irony, irony of that is that it's because of this guy. So Jimmy Swaggart lost the case in, the, in 1990 to the Californian um, Equalisation Board so where they determined that because he was selling religious goods he had to start paying tax on that, it wasn't tax free. 
And so the Watchtower actually went um, with uh, supporter Jimmy Swaggart there because they did not want this to come through because they had made they had made billions and billions of dollars of equity that they own through being a massive publishing organisation. They published more religious literature than any other religion in the 1900s. They have the best, the number one selling book of all time for um, non-fiction was the Truth Book. And so they made so much money that they had free labour making, donation supporting, and then sold at a profit door to door for a free, free uh, labour distributing unit. Made them incredibly wealthy. Jimmy Swaggart loses a court case and they decided that they didn't want to pay tax on the profits of selling publications and they went to a donation basis, and now they're getting just a fraction of what they used to get from the door-to-door -door work. So now they are not making the money that they used to make from being a great publishing organisation. And so that is why now they're, they're struggling financially and getting more and more begging for donations. <clears throat> the other area that is affecting them at this moment is the failure of Armageddon to come. <laughs> and, uh, the, you can't just go on forever. And have uh, and say that it's about to come and not come. So they can last a few more decades, but they can't last centuries. For somebody born in the year 2000, 1914 is an irrelevant ancient history. Just like for me, 1799 is irrelevant. 1799 is what they used to say was the beginning of the last days. They moved it forward to 1914, and I'm old enough to think that's recent. But um, for my child, 1914 is meaningless, and so they cannot go on with that. That. Um, type of doctrine and have any hope of survival. So what I would, if they're intelligent, they need a, a new charismatic leader to come along and move them into just mainstream Christianity. They have eight million members, it's not gonna die overnight. So it needs to uh, uh, change their doctrine if it's got hope, the hope to survive. And this is a map I just did. So I went through all the uh, population growth uh, rates of all the countries around the world, compared it to what, um, what their latest report was. And all the red ones are where Jehovah's Witnesses are growing at a, a rate that is lower than the population growth rate. And so the only countries that are actually growing above the population growth rate are these ones which are fairly irrelevant because they have got so few members there that are like it's a few thousand members in Indonesia with 400 million people. So a 10% growth rate doesn't, is, a, is hardly anybody. So there's not much growth happening here. Through Europe, it's mostly just the displacement of people moving back and forth. A lot of the Polish brothers have been moving into other countries, and so there's no growth actually in Europe, even though it may look like that. You just have a few countries in South America, and uh, Central America, and also in Africa there that are growing. And 10 countries um, were about 75% of all the growth in, in the world. And um, what is tragic about this for the Watchtower is that these countries are all poor developing countries, and it doesn't solve their problem around being uh, having financial issues. So um, I think that's sort of very encouraging to see. And, and when you consider that Jehovah's Witnesses spent two billion hours last year preaching, so two billion hours was not enough to replace the children that have left. So uh, my conclusion tonight is uh, three things that I think uh, should happen. I think governments need to be stronger in bringing account religions who break the law. I think it's great to see the Royal Commission where they have set out to actually assist, they haven't done it in a destructive way, done it in an assisting way to, to, to help change religions that are breaking the law. Um, other areas that you know could be looked at are shunning and blood transfusions. I think uh, governments need to remove tax exemption for religion. It's absolutely got no place. The, the interesting thing here is religions squeal about this, but if uh, the re only reason they worry about this is because they're hoarding money. So if you uh, give money to a charity, the purpose of that charity is to give money back to the community. If you're giving money back to the community, you don't pay tax, because you don't pay tax on revenue, you pay tax on profit. So if they are having, making profits, then that means they're not giving money back to the community. So there's no reason why they should not be paying tax. And then finally, I think education is critical. Uh, we need to improve our education system. I think ethics and critical thinking skills should be mandatory uh, subjects 